Hello and welcome to season five of The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no holds barred truth about being a woman post 40. Created and hosted by me, journalist and author Sam Baker. What even is the right sort of girl? That's a question my guest this week has long struggled to answer. TV presenter and self-proclaimed misfit Anita Rani always felt that she was somehow wrong. A feeling that was exacerbated when she moved to London to break into the media and found herself too brown, too northern, too female. Now 43, she co-fronts two national institutions, Radio 4's Woman's Hour and BBC's Country File, and has finally reached a point where she felt able to tackle the question, who even am I? In her memoir, The Right Sort of Girl. Boys just get away with murder. I've just seen boys being able to do whatever they want my whole life, and it sucks. Join Anita and me as we journey from 1970s Bradford to her perch on the top of the media tree via eldest Punjabi daughter guilt, never, ever, ever talking about periods, grunge, and Oprah worship. On the way, Anita tells me why South Asian women are total badasses, why shape-shifting to fit other people's expectations is a total waste of energy, and how she learned to own her anger. This is a celebration of being in your 40s, being yourself, and finding your purpose. And I'm pretty sure that you, like me, will love her for it. I'm really happy that you want me on, on your podcast, so thank you. Oh, that means such a lot. Thank you. How is Woman's Hour? How does it feel? I mean, the radio show, right? The interview. Yeah, the job everybody wants. Is that? Yeah, I mean, funnily enough, I know it sounds like I didn't want it. It wasn't on my radar because I just thought, why would they want me to present Woman's Hour? I'm an idiot. <laughs> but uh, it's happened and I absolutely love it. And I was petrified for the first three months, mad anxiety every Thursday night. And now I sort of feel that, yeah, I want to own that little space and put my stamp on it, whatever that is. And I think I was just nervous stepping into Radio 4. I mean, it's Woman's Hour, the mothership. And, you know, you kind of do this thing where you think, do I need to be all Radio 4 now? And then I thought, no, that's the worst thing I can do. I should just be myself. So I'm really enjoying it, really loving it. It is such a grown up thing, isn't it? It really seems like 40 has been a great big kind of watershed for you in so many ways. Yeah, I love being 40. I love my 40s. I'm only three years in, but so far, so good. And maybe it was more 41. 40 sort of was it. I didn't really take it seriously. I turned 40. <laughs> I'm still in my 30s. And I suppose getting Woman's Hour, writing the book, that's the biggest thing, you know. It's a moment where I've just thought, what now? You know, I've spent 20 odd years just on this conveyor belt energy, just head down, like build a career, build a career. And I've loved it. I loved it. And now it's like, well, what more? There has to be something more. There has to be some more meaning to my life. (laughs) Was it kind of reaching a level of achievement and going, okay, I'm here. What next? Or was it actually a period of like reflection? Like, okay, who am I now? What's this mean for me? Yeah, I think a combination of things. I think recognizing I got to a certain level in my world and my industry that not many women who look like me get to and recognizing that my experience was quite different and not many women had spoken about that experience, but it means to be a sort of South Asian second generation woman. Also, you know, I follow, I'm in parts of groups and follow lots of amazing women on Instagram and there's lots of conversations happening about, you know, little pockets about that experience, but no one else is talking about it. So I thought, okay, I should, I should talk about it. I should say what I've been through and maybe people will resonate. Maybe it will help some people. Maybe it'll open some people's eyes. Yeah. It just felt like the time was right. And also COVID happened and we all got a bit more introspective, didn't we? I think every single TV presenter, actor, everyone's been sitting like typing up their memoirs, but yeah, we all had time to reflect and slow down. And, and I, I haven't really spent a huge amount of time thinking about my childhood or how I got here. So it was just a moment to do that. And neither have I had loads of therapy either. So it really was just putting it all on the page. And I found it incredibly therapeutic and cathartic. And I'm utterly petrified of it now being 
unleashed into the world. It's like, I've done it. I'm like, what have I done? <laughs> it's quite exposing, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. You do go there in a couple of places. Yeah, I really do. And I had to. First yeah. of all, what an opportunity. Like someone has asked me to write my memoir is incredible. That is like, no, no, not many people get asked to do that. And then I thought, if I'm going to do this, I have to really do it. This is my one opportunity to say mm. something. And so I spoke to my mum, had a conversation with her to get permission to say, look, I want to talk about what happened and how I feel about my childhood and our relationship. And and she said, do it. She said, do it for me. Be my voice. I couldn't say it. My generation haven't been able to say it. I know, right? It's amazing. Yeah. And she said, look, I can't change what I may or may not have done because of my own upbringing, but it's almost like, you know, when the daughters educate the mothers or liberate, bring them along so that we've had a bit of that. And the book's really, really done that because we've talked about lots of stuff. She hasn't read it. You've read it. You've read it before. I've husband. read it. Yeah. And I had a chat with my husband as well. And he said, speak your truth. And he says, if it's your truth, then no one can argue with that. <laughs> Even if it means revealing the fact that I was a bit unsure about getting married on my wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he can cope with that, then that's fine, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it, about writing memoir and that kind of thing. It's like, so long as it's your truth and you're not putting words in anyone else's mouth, then that's all you can do. Yeah, I hope so. You know, I was writing it for my younger self, writing it for that little Asian brown girl in Bradford who can't see herself anywhere in the landscape. And I was writing it for myself. I think I say in the book, you know, it's about empowering myself. As much as turning 40 made me feel quite yeah powerful and I've written my book and I've got Woman's Hour, I also felt like I was sort of losing control of my life a little bit. I was sort of sick of other people making decisions for me. Mm. Also, I wanted to do something creative and have a creative outlook. And this, this is what came out of it. I wanted to talk to you about what you call shape-shifting because I think so many women will identify with that anyway. But if you then add into that an intersection of being brown or queer or or northern as you you've using northern as an intersection i am not using northern as an intersection I just <laughs> want to know that. and you layer onto those you know being a good daughter being british being indian how old were you when you realized that you had spent a lot of your life trying to squeeze yourself into other people's boxes it's something that I've done so effortlessly since I was tiny that you don't even think about it. It just happens. You go from one place to the next and you just instantly understand what's required of you. Like, okay, I dial down my ethnicity in this bit and like I have to ramp up my goody Indian girl with these people. And, you know, okay, now I'm in a different space. I can be somebody else. And now I'm in a workspace. And I think when I've really noticed or really thought about it is only sort of recently where you realize that you are bending who you are to fit into another space it's not sustainable like don't get me wrong like like when I'm with my mates I'll talk in a certain way and when I'm with my parents I'll talk in a certain way I'm not talking about that in the book I talk about like the workspace for instance it's a book from my perspective but there's lots for people to relate to but yeah in a workspace as women you know without even things being said we know how we're meant to behave or how we're expected to behave let's put it that way And so we find ourselves adapting to fit what's required of us. And you're sort of killing a bit of yourself when you do that. And I guess I have just sort of woken up, I don't know when it started, but you just start feeling like I'm not a whole self, I'm not a whole person. Combined with living through an amazing moment where people are using their voices. So there are people I really respect and admire opening up and come, let's mention Michaela Cole. Just, incredible she's amazing she's otherworldly but you know her going right I'm gonna say something makes it easier for other people to do the same it's made me reflect on the way I behave in different situations and also it's exhausting yes. it's, it's really exhausting and you know the dutiful Indian girl shape is exhausting yeah so I just thought fuck it it's time to live a whole life I mean I'm probably still gonna do it you know we all do it when something's so hardwired but it's nice to be able to say what you really think. It's really interesting. Somebody else said to me something similar about how it is completely exhausting. All of those things that you do, especially when you learn to do them as a little girl, you know, like being what you think people want you to be and second guessing Mm -hmm. and styling as you've written about really brilliantly, like dialing this bit of you up and this bit of you down to try to manage the way other people treat you. If you think about what you've already achieved, what could you have achieved if you hadn't had to expend all that energy 
I know, right? On that. I know. It's nuts. (laughs) And also making yourself fit when you know you don't fit, right? So as a kid, Mm. the world around me, and I say this in the book, and I'm glad I'm talking about it. This is what I was talking to my mum about. I'm like, look, I'm calling out a lot of bullshit in our culture. And this isn't me doing something down. I'm deeply proud of my ethnicity and my heritage. And I love being in two worlds and all of that. But my God, there was a lot of crap that I had to deal with as a woman. And I didn't want to be a girl. You know, I just, I'd rather, I wanted to be playing out with the boys. And it almost pushed me so far to the other end where I just didn't wear makeup and just was in baggy trousers. And I don't know how much of that is to do with, you know, not wanting to fit this mold of what was required of me. How much of it was to do with the fact that I was just growing up in the 90s and it was all grunge and Doc Martens. Yes, yeah. And how much of that is to do with, and this is again, you know, thinking back and reflecting that as a teenager I just clocked to the men start looking at you in certain ways and you just rather cover up you know not explore your sexuality well that's how I responded to it anyway it's much nicer just to wear a big old baggy shirt and walk around with a scowl on your face that's really interesting because talking about the aging process and getting to the kind of invisibility point, there's a real divide between the people who were head turners. I was never that thing. They slightly miss that male gaze thing, even if it was a bit annoying. And the people who are like, oh, blessed relief. Yeah. Not to even have to think about that anymore. And then you start to look at the way blokes doing it to young women in the street and you think, that is really predatory. It's encroaching on your psychic space. We grew up in the eight nineties, 2000s with, I don't know, Nuts and Zoo and Loaded magazine and Page 3 and Upskirting. And like, this was like normal. <laughs> it was like, yeah. And like, what does that do to your psyche, as you say, you know, that this is the culture that we're in? And it's that notion that if you were a woman who's trying to build a career in TV, part of that trajectory for you will be that you get your kit off on a bloke's mag, because you write about that, don't you, in the book? Yeah, well, yeah, one of my first ever photo shoots, it wasn't a lad's mag, it was was like an Asian glossy. Yeah, the first ever photo shoot I was asked to do. The editor wanted me to do it in my pants, in my my kex. (laughs) (laughs) And you wouldn't get your kex out no, from magazine cover. Are you serious? I remember saying to my agent, I don't want to do it. And he phoned me up and he said, I can't believe you're sending this photo shoot down. I'm like, da, da, da. I was like, I honestly just have no desire to be in my pants. Now, now that I'm getting <laughs> older, I'm like, who wants me to do a picture? I'd take some pictures in my pants. No, I, wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, I'd like the idea of it, but it just wasn't for me. Some women, great, amazing bodies, feel empowered. It's complicated, isn't it? Because on the one hand, absolutely, if you are in control and it's what you want to do, that's great. But, you know, that fine line between being empowered by it and being exploited. And it being the only path as well. I'm going to drag myself as much as you back to your childhood. It's still consistent with a shape-shifting thing, but you describe being a Punjabi daughter. And it really made me laugh that every time you talk about Punjabi boys, you're like... (laughs) They get away with murder. I mean, they have it easy. <laughs> like, I know. I was describing this book to my sister-in-law the other day, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I don't care. You know, the only people who are really going to be offended are Punjabi men, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did have it easy. Completely different world to women. The Punjabi men than my family, anyway, I think, you know, it's, it's a sweeping statement, but it's sort of pretty true that boys have it much easier in Asian families than girls. The little prince syndrome. And yeah. so I talk about how that means that, you you know, South Asian women are badasses. Like we've had to go off and do it for ourselves and educate ourselves. And the boys got everything handed to on a plate. And that comes from, you know, a culture where you are not really ours. You will always belong to the family who you marry into. Like, what? what the, what is this? It's almost like you are this burden. You're just this burden that they have to deal with. Until they can offload you. Yes, someone else. Obviously, my parents love me dearly, but it's definitely been in the background, you know, and it's what I've experienced with, you know, the older generation, my aunts and my mother's generation. And then once you're in that family, you make it work, however. And then the boys just get away with murder. I've just seen boys being able to do whatever they want my whole life. And it sucks. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, bloody typical, isn't it? There's the bit where you say your paternal grandma, they said when you were born, we don't celebrate girls. Correct. Yeah, that's it. Don't celebrate girls. I mean, a few people have asked me about that. Like, yeah, it's a shocking sentence. It's so but striking, yeah. I think there'll be a lot of South Asian women who'll pick that up and go, yep. Yeah. It's definitely changing. You know, I am a woman in my 40s and there's women my age who have teenage daughters and they will be bringing them up in all sorts of amazing ways. And again, you know, each individual family has their own culture. But generally, 
And historically, that's it. Girls are not to be celebrated. They're a burden until they are married off and they're someone else's responsibility. And then their job is to just make sure that they behave in the way that their in-laws expect them to behave. I mean, that's bollocks. The whole thing is just, I mean, it is changing. I sound like I'm talking about something that's prehistoric. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's definitely my experience. That's That was my family. And we were incredibly working class. You know, my grandparents came over in the 50s. Well, from a rural community. And I say in the book that Punjabis are the Irish of India. <laughs> It really made me laugh. I'm glad it made you laugh. Yeah, we're kind of, you know, hardworking. Like I say, you know, men worked hard, women worked harder, and you bring your kids up as best you can, which is why probably my family's fitted in the community up north really well because it was, you know, really working class environment that they stepped into. Everyone was working class. Women in those families, they're tough, but my granny didn't have much space left for tenderness. But then she had to deal with my granddad, you know, and that's kind of the world I grew up in, a bit of dysfunction, you know, health bit of trauma, alcoholism, domestic violence chucked in. We've had it all. <laughs> we have it all. I think it takes you until your 40s to get to a point where you can start to look at your grandparents and your parents and think, well, this is why they were like that. Yeah. This is why my gran wouldn't have hugged me if her life had depended on it, for instance, or, you know. Yeah. And, and forgive them. Just like, okay, you know, you're a product of your experience. And also, I guess for me, it's I don't want to carry that baggage forward. This book is like therapeutic for me. It's just me in my little world, typing it out in this strange COVID period. And whilst we're writing it, working it out, you know, figuring it out, like this is what happened to me. And this is why I'm like this. And this is why I wasn't very good at vulnerability and why marriage scares the shit out of me. And mm. And why I'm so full of anger and getting better at that. I guess for you, coping with that duality that you describe, growing up, being a good Indian girl indoors and being as British as possible outdoors and dialing down your Indianness so you aren't subject to racist taunts outside and dialing down your Britishness indoors so you're not called coconut. I mean, it's no wonder you're, a, what should we say, multifaceted. Yes, <laughs> Yeah, it means I can read a room quite well when I walk into it. But I think that just comes from being a child having to walk on eggshells where you just don't know who's going to blow at any given moment. It was not even that conscious. You just know instinctively, mm. right, I need to behave like this in this environment. But the whole dialing down of my Indianness, it was just so obvious that that's what I had to do to get by it. And I'm not alone in thinking that. There was just no space to talk about. No one was interested. No one was interested in knowing anything about your culture. You know, it's only now we're really talking about things because we've got a generation who's come of age, were born here, brought up here, and now are doing jobs that aren't the traditional jobs that Asian kids go into. And you've got conversations happening and people sharing their stories, making people pay attention. <laughs> I think people are interested now. We need to talk about all these different cultures that make up our country to kind of understand who we are. We're going through a big identity shift as a nation, I think. You know, if you grew up in the 80s and 90s, and like you write, it's all about assimilation, wasn't it? Yeah. It's all about fitting in. And now it's completely the opposite, oh which is God. good. Someone said to me, you know, you're in your 40s now. You must feel so like powerful and you can say what you think compared to like younger generation, you know, that when they, I was like, no, actually, I look at 20 year olds now and I just think, wow, you're so mm. confident in your identity. You're unapologetic about who you are and you recognize that your value is in your authentic self only you can bring that to the table and they're so oh I love it I feel like I've written this book and I'm like I want to empower the younger generation the younger generation don't need this book they've got it going on this is for like my generation and women older than me who have had to adapt to fit in and not being able to really express how they feel the younger generation are amazing I think lots of people will identify with it because like you say I think that women of your age and even as old as me will really identify with a lot of the experience but I do think there's going to be little Anitas like you say in their bedroom in Bradford or or wherever just kind of going there is a path because you can see a path how old were you before you could see someone like you who'd achieved what you wanted to achieve I watched Bargy on the beach so there was like Mira Sayal and Gurinder Chudder mm. both like legends, heroes, idols, made this amazing film called Bargy on the Beach where a group of Asian women go on a coach ride to Blackpool. But every story in it was so true to my experience, you know, the kind of 
girl dating someone behind her mother's back and you know the woman in a violent relationship and just all of it I'm like yeah this is the first time I'd seen it but it made me go it's Asian women telling that story so maybe I could do that and then I started working in my local Asian radio station and yeah was that the beginning of your path to your career Yes, yes, absolutely, actually, because when it came to choosing my degree, I wanted to go off and do drama, but my dad wasn't having any. It was like, what are you going to do with drama? (laughs) Fair enough. I probably would have been like domestic abuse victim number three on the bill. (laughs) (laughs) And then he was like, you're going to do law, you're going to do law. And it's like, oh, I don't know. That's not what I want to do. Anyway, I did broadcasting at Leeds. But yeah, there's no set trajectory. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking. I actually didn't think I'd be a presenter. I thought I'd go and make documentaries. I don't know, tell stories. You yeah. can tell stories in loads of ways, can't you? I mean, that's really what you're doing with the right sort of girl yes. is telling lots of people's stories through your own story. Yes. Tell me a bit about Pritam Kaur. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so I felt I had to tell people what I learned about my family history because I made my Who Do You Think You Are, which is a big honour. And I discovered, you know, it's all about the partition of India. The reaction to that was immense. I had this huge reaction and people were saying, how do we not know about this piece of history, even though it's British history? We don't talk about the dark bits of British history. (laughs) So I made a program called My Family Partition and Me, which then went on to tell the story of partition and explore it in different ways, which I co-produced, which was very exciting. Pritham Kaur was my paternal grandfather's first wife. He was married, he had two children, and he was living in what became Pakistan. He was away with the British Indian Army. And when partition happened, hell broke loose. And as far as we knew, his entire family died. And Pritham Kaur, his first wife, killed herself by jumping into a well, which is what a lot of women did at the time. This is a family story and I knew that she had a son I didn't even know her name my family don't talk about her name and so when I discovered this woman and had this photo in my hand and I knew her name the experience was just more than me just discovering my family history. it was like she was with me all of them all those women who had no choice and I learned about the atrocities of partition and what happened to women and how they were being raped abducted murdered or being killed by their own families so that they wouldn't be raped, abducted or murdered by somebody (laughs) else. It's unbearable. But also what I learned was that a lot of women were kidnapped. And then once they'd been taken by, you know, the other side, whether that's Sikhs, Hindus or Muslims, their own families wouldn't want them back because you're tainted. And so they were stuck. And so they converted and they married their abductors. Oh, my God. And so I don't know, and I know my family will hate me saying this, because it's much easier to just go, she died. Yeah, we don't have to address all the rest, do you? Yeah, well, we don't know. It's so insane. And I had no idea about any of this. If anything like that had happened in Britain, there'd be a documentary about it every single day, and yet nobody talks about this. Did I read somewhere, I probably got this completely wrong, but about 70,000 women were abducted and uh, just unaccounted for. So you've got families who will have a grandmother who was either Sikh or Hindu or Muslim and converted, and that will be the family secret. But once you know that, then you know that your family were complicit in the chaos. History's dark. (laughs) It's, yeah, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? You know what, I can't remember if it's in the book or whether I heard you say it on a, a podcast that I listened to, where you talk about being in a sort of limbo between the British stiff upper lip culture and the Indian, you know, we mustn't talk about that. We mustn't wash our dirty linen in public. Yeah, I wrote about my um, miscarriage that I had a couple of years ago. And I wrote that in that article because I just was like, I'll deal with that at Christmas. Ignore, ignore, mm. ignore. And then went off and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro for comic relief and just had a panic attack. I was like, (sighs) and uh, Mm. actually one of the main reasons for writing the book is I wanted to have some power over shame. Yeah. And I've been brought up with so much shame, so much that it's just weighing me down. And this was a way of taking some power back, smashing a few taboos. And I've always been fascinated by Like, I love Oprah. (laughs) Who doesn't love Oprah? All of us love her, but she's amazing. But, like, I've been so fascinated by her ability to talk about who she is, where she comes from, her experiences. And it's like, how do you do that? How do you just talk about things that I've been told never to mention, like family trauma and stuff? 
She's incredible. She's like a preacher. I went to an Oprah convention. Oh my <laughs> it's God. a long story. Um, with my friend Viv. It was for an article. And the final act was Oprah doing a session. Oh my God. The entire stadium was on their feet. I, I can't even I haven't even got the words. It was absolutely mesmerizing. What is that? Do you know if she was Indian and living in India, she'd be worshipped as a god. She really was. <laughs> she'd probably set up a religion. She'd probably have a cult. But she's got it. That is some kind of next level power of communication, charisma, and also empathy and how she makes people mm. feel. And that is like How do I get to a point where I'm liberated and not crippled by it? And again, I think it comes back to turning 40. Like, what do I want to do now? Do I really want to carry on with this burden of shame? Or do I just want to put it in a book? and just put it out (laughs) and tell everybody. (laughs) Tell everyone about about never having spoken about periods with my mum. Tell me about having periods as a Southeast Asian girl in Bradford whose mum has never told her anything. Nothing, nothing. What do I say? The first rule of puberty as an Asian woman is you never talk about puberty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't know why. I had this conversation with my mum again. Even my mum didn't talk about it with her sisters. It's just shameful. My mum had her period, didn't know what the hell it was, cried, came and told her mum, and her mum shouted at her and said, it's because you eat too much tamarind, and now you're not <laughs> going to grow. And that's what my mum got told when she started her period. And that was it. And so she just went to bed and cried because she's like, that's it. It's to do with men. It's to do with the patriarchy. It's to do with but women's issues are dirty and sinful. And women have just bought it. And, you know, the women in certainly my family, it's about not drawing attention to those womanly things and just making it all right for the men around you. You know, dial down your femininity. Shh, no one wants to deal with that. So mom never really talked to me about my period. She never sat me down and told me about it. And I just had to figure it out by talking talking to friends. And again, it's like standing on the periphery of conversations because I just thought it was so rude to talk about. (laughs) So crazy thinking back. I had a really serious conversation with my mum about it though. I did say like, that's really, it's not on mum. It's not on that you didn't tell me about it. She agreed. Now you've talked about that. Have you talked about menopause? No, no, but we've had the period chat now. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, you'll probably talk about menopause when you're about 85. Maybe I should instigate that conversation. And I'll talk to her about it. I'd love Um, to know what she says. Well, I know she didn't do any HRT. My mum's generation, they just, and my mum and her sisters, they don't sit around and talk about their problems. They're just so, they just do. They just suck it up and get on with it. Like I've never, I don't think I've seen my mum cry. She's never moaned. It's just, they're very tender. They're very maternal. But it's like the minute they start talking about themselves is the minute they've made it about them. And their lives are about everybody apart from them, which is just exhausting. It must be. Yeah, there's not room, is there? No room. I think that's a generational thing. I don't just think it's my mum. I think it's a yeah. Um, it's almost that stoic World War Two generation attitude, you know? Yeah, they just get on with it. Let's get on with it. Now, I was going to say they just look at our generation and think, oh, you don't know you're born. But actually, that's not true. My mum is incredibly proud that I am talking about it. I'm breaking that. I love that you met your husband at a rave. <laughs> You know, I said that in the, the Express picked it up and the headline was shocking way Anita Rani met husband. <laughs> As opposed to really normal way Anita Rani met husband. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we met in a rave. I came to London and um, loved music and worked at the music department at the BBC and worked at the Top of the Pops. And, you know, just that was my world. And uh, yeah, a mate of mine said, oh, I'll come to this warehouse party. I was like, oh, I don't want to go. I'm a bit boring as well. I can stay in and just do nothing quite happily. Woman after my own heart. Yeah, I love a potter. Yes. Put some music on, potter, lovely. And I turned up in this warehouse in Dalston and walked into this room. And for the first time, I was in this brilliant rave playing drum and bass and 80% of the people in the room were brown, like me. I was like, oh. How often did that happen? Never, never. I mean, I grew up in a really white environment. I had a very Asian world as well, you know, going to the temple at the weekends, my mum's family and family friends. But my actual social circle, my culture is very white. Like My school friends are all white. Went to uni, white, drum and bass clubs. I tried to go to the Asian society once. That didn't work. Where are the white people? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But this was all the misfits, like all the Asian, all the tattooed and pierced and gender bending and curious and bonkers Asian kids from all over Britain who never fit in in their little world congregating in this room 
all the creatives and everybody was there doing something different. People had jacked in their careers as bankers and lawyers to run nightclubs. Like, yes, I get this lot. And that's where he was. Yeah, that's where he was. Yeah, yeah, he's brilliant. He had a great record collection, been traveling, open-minded and incredibly vulnerable and gentle. And so that freaked me out. It's like, ooh. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's a bit weird. But you still didn't want to get married and you certainly didn't want a big Bradford wedding. No, nothing in my world ever. I just never dreamt of a big wedding, never thought of getting married, certainly didn't want a big Indian wedding in Bradford. And also all my previous boyfriends had been white. Does your mum know? Shh, don't tell my mum about my white boyfriends. (laughs) <laughs> I'm pretty sure she's not a podcast listener. Well, maybe she is. Really. She finds everything I've done. She's so proud. She's like, I Googled it. Not Google. I Googled it. All right. Mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, having boyfriends was not just not part of the culture. You don't date. You just marry somehow. Uh, so they were thrilled. And when I phoned my mum and said I'd met someone called Bapinda, she just lost her shit. Bapinda? <laughs> Bapinda! Indian! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, he's, he innately understands an aspect of who I am. And yeah. We're having a good time. So kind of what you thought might be a trap is actually in a way kind of has empowered you to be more you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That true? yeah. I, I absolutely thought on my wedding day, why am I here? Who is this person who's having this big Indian wedding? And, and I'm 32. And, you know, 32 is nothing. But I was made to feel like that is it it's doomsday I get married now or yeah I felt like they disowned me I felt like I was dishonoring everybody and I was told that this is what's making everyone feel pride never mind that I had a I'd moved to London I'd bought a couple of flats I was on national television none of that mattered this is it this is the moment that's defining what kind of woman I am and it's because I was having a big Indian marriage marrying an Indian man that I made my parents feel proud isn't that Yeah, I I totally get that, though. I totally get it. And can I ask, how are they about children? Have you had you felt under pressure to have children once you were married? No. I mean, an uncle of mine once years ago at a party had a few whiskeys and came. Anita, you know, career is career, but now is your time. Have your children now. I'm like, all right. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that. I've had... One woman asked me once, uh, an extended family member from my in-laws sidled up to me at a function and said, when are you making our boopy a father? I mean, and I just looked at her and normally I'm really polite because, you know, I'm the right sort of girl. I just looked at her and I don't even know how to answer that question. I'm sorry. And that sort of made her, I think I shocked her a bit. Because it's this podcast and it's you, Sam, I've kind of spent a lifetime swerving this. But I just think... Women are just so different. In the same way that I hadn't dreamt of having the big wedding, I never really thought about kids either. So if it happens, it happens. Like I say, if it happens, everyone will know about it. And if it doesn't, then that's okay. I mean, I'm okay. Everyone will know about it. Exactly. (laughs) Everyone. Everyone will. And you'll be all right. You'll be the first to know. (laughs) I love you for writing, though, that you're terrified of parenthood. I love you for that. Because I don't think I've ever heard anybody say it. You know, I definitely felt, I mean, I'm not a parent, but a terrifying prospect. I love that you picked that up, you know. Everyone keeps asking me about kids and doing the interviews, but no one's picked up on that. I said that. Yeah, I'm terrified. I'm terrified because I found it really difficult being a kid. My mum and dad's relationship was really dysfunctional, as was every couple around me, which is why the idea of marriage why would any woman willingly go into this institution that is totally set up to serve men? It just makes made no sense to me. I saw women all around me putting up with all sorts of shit and still making chapatis and still telling their children to respect their fathers. And st- I'm like, what is this? Like, this doesn't, you know, and then their children were their worlds. For our mothers, we are their worlds because we're their lights. We're the only joy It's a heavy burden for a child. Uh, So you grow up, especially the eldest daughters in these families, with a lot of guilt and you carry a lot. You carry a lot. And then you don't know how that, what damage that's done to you. So yeah, who knows what kind of parent I'd be? I don't know. It's terrifying. What if you mess them up? (laughs) Yeah, I know. It's like, I mean, nobody knows, obviously, but well, maybe it's overthinking, but I do find it weird that nobody thinks, well, probably everybody thinks about it and nobody admits it, but you know scary yeah I think so it's the responsibility it's huge (laughs) (laughs) no but it is I mean you know this I mean I've got my niece is amazing and watching her grow and I've got beautiful goddaughters and everyone probably has these thoughts and then they have them and then it's amazing so yeah yeah. it just 
terrifying. Goes where it goes ultimately, doesn't it? But it's it's huge. Yeah. Yeah, it's massive. Yeah. <laughs> there must be an amazing payoff to having children. Otherwise, why would we would we women go through it? <laughs> yeah, totally. And keep going through it as well. Keep going through it, yeah. Keep doing it. Consciously do it again. Yes, exactly. Before I go on to like the bit at the end where I ask you all the normal questions, I wanted to ask you about anger. Because when I wrote the chapter in my book about anger, it got a huge response. And you talk quite a lot about anger all the way through. What point in your life did you realise it was okay that your anger was legitimate? Like now. (laughs) Seriously. Yeah. That sounds so insane to say. But you're just told as a good woman you're not to be angry and... It's just not how women behave. And if you are, you know, you're judged for it. But it was in the process of writing this book and hearing other people talk about feeling angry and having a conversation with my brother. We were like, you know, I've got a really damn good reason to be fucking angry. And all of us have. And so I'm just going to own it. I'm not going to be afraid of it. And what do you do with it now, apart from write books? I used to do karate for many years, you know, when I was a kid. I run. I don't know what I do with my anger. I say at the beginning of the book, I haven't really dealt with any of this. I've done no sort of self-reflection. I'm not, haven't spent time on myself. I've gone straight into the deep end. I'm just going to put it on the page, put it out there and then work through it later. And hopefully it won't end up in, you know, the pound bucket at Woolworths. (laughs) <laughs> it's not good it's and not gonna end up on, that's all right then I'll just you know duck away and carry on yeah I put it on the page that's what I've done with it what did you do with it um well I, I slightly combusted for a bit but then yeah I, I think that I, I wrote it out a bit I don't know whether I intended to do that but yeah I think I did and now I, I still feel angry but I just feel it feels more productive it feels like I can take it and rather than just like flinging it out there like a kid learning what to do with their superpowers I feel like I can can channel it in the directions it's it's deserved exactly what I want to do so I also write I've had a life full of passion I'm very passionate about lots of things but now I have purpose and the book is what do I do with the anger like I'm so angry but how do we implement change so I start by putting my story out and then let's see where it leads but yeah I don't want to stop I want to carry on using my voice and uh channeling the anger and also get a punch bag because also boxing is really good for your upper arms <laughs> I saw someone doing kickboxing in the park near where I lived the other day and I was thinking oh I quite fancy that it's brilliant yeah I did a bit of kickboxing when I moved to London and then joined the hardcore boxing gym near me just before lockdown but loads of women go and it's brilliant just gets it out of you it's good that's good I quite like the idea of that how do you feel about aging When I was a kid, I wasn't one of those girls who wanted to be older. So I'd see girls wanting to look older, like, look, I just was like, I'm all right. I just want to be a kid. And now I feel like I'm at my most powerful. I think women in their 40s now are just riding a wave. I think we are youthful. My my grandma was 45 when I was born and she was old. Yeah. Old. She looked she looked the same we are dynamic we've lived lives we are independent and you know we've got something to say and it's just a really great time to be in my 40s ask me when I get to 50 though Sam I don't know I don't want to waste life worry I've spent so long worrying about stuff like you know we waste all this time worrying about exactly aging is just inevitable it's like this idea that I want to be youthful 100% I believe in vitality and youthfulness and I want to stay vibrant and healthy but yeah I'll get old I want to get old and get you know eccentric yeah do you want to be a like a mad old lady yeah Yeah, I totally do yeah I want to swan around in silks shouting at people drinking martinis at nine in the morning (laughs) Uh, what's your emotional age? I don't know. I veer between 12 and 80. So, you know, I can, I'm like nowhere in between. I'm either totally emotionally stunted or just really old before my time. Like a wise old woman. Uh, can you recommend a book that you, either something you've read recently that you loved or something that's really meant a lot to you? Oh, Girl, Woman, Other. I'm sure that's not original. It's just Bernadine. Doesn't matter. Everisto, I mean, wow, beautiful layers and complexities of what it means to be a woman and the different types of women and the world she took us into. And yeah, she blew me away, but also her style of writing, just beautiful, clever, brilliant, booker winning badass. 
Couldn't put it better. I mean, we've talked about the fact that younger women don't really seem to need advice, but what one bit of advice would you give younger women? Ditch the shame. Yes. And the guilt, also guilt. Guilt, it's just waste, waste, waste. Go forth, be brilliant, use your voices, just go, go, shout, run to the hills and shout. <laughs> <laughs> What's your superpower? My energy. My energy is my superpower. And that's one thing I don't like. I get tired. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I'm very aware that rest is important because you need energy if you want to do things. So yeah, I've always been very energetic self-motivated they're pretty important superpowers you're a grafter aren't you yeah i'm a grafter i like people as well i think that's a superpower a lot of people i know say they like people but they don't no not really no (laughs) or they like them to a point yeah that might be me actually actually that's me that's true i don't like old people there's a lot of idiots out there (laughs) is there an old bird role model do you have an old bird role model isabel allende Oh, she's a legend. So she is my old bird, absolute queen hero, who I want to be when I get old. Isn't she amazing? Because you interviewed her for Woman's Hour, didn't you? I have had her on the podcast. She is amazing. She changed my life. Interviewing her for Woman's Hour was one of the greatest gifts my career has given me. Like to be on Woman's Hour and get to interview these women, I'm like, hell yes. Her voice was sort of ringing in the back of my head. Speak your truth. Nothing will change unless you tell it how it is. What did she say? Husbands are (laughs) replaceable. Yes. Her new husband, as she said to him, well, you've got 20 years. And she's like 79. It's like She's amazing. Also, there's another old bird. There's a, a Rothschild woman. She's called Pananika Rothschild. There's a book called, in fact, here's another book recommendation called The Baroness. And it's written by her great niece or somebody. She was born into the world of the Rothschilds with all the splendor and privilege that comes with it. Got married pre or post World War One. had four kids and then thought, fuck this. I can't live this life. Went to America and started living and patronizing old jazz boys. Charlie Parker used to come and hang out at her flat. And she used to sit in the jazz bars with her fur coat over the chair and her Rolls Royce parked outside smoking cigarettes. That's who I want to be. And they called her the Baroness. So, yeah, Pananika Rothschild and Isabel Allende. They're my old bird heroes. You have excellent taste in old bird role models. Last one. I noticed that you said Punjabi is hands down the best South Asian language to swear in. So how many fucks do you give? Oh, I wish I didn't give any, Sam. I wish I didn't give any fucks, but I think I give. I still give a few fucks. I'm so nervous about this book coming out. I want to be able to just go, I don't give a fuck. One day I'll get there. One day. I mean, I care, but maybe that is, maybe that is it. Maybe part of me doesn't give a fuck anymore. So I'm just going to put it out there. Yeah, you don't give a fuck enough to have written it anyway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I give enough of a fuck not to have revealed all my secrets. (laughs) (laughs) That's the next book. Yeah. And I've got the proof and your dal recipe isn't in the back. So how am I going to get hold of your dal recipe? Because I obviously need it. Yeah, I'll get it to you. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little dal recipe in the back. Everyone needs a decent dal. I'll cook it for you and send it to you. Oh, my God. I'll take you up on that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's been so brilliant talking to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. You're great. I love this podcast. More power to you, Sam. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you. Thank you for listening. You can hear a new episode of The Shift each Tuesday on Acast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please do rate, review and follow because it really does help other people find us. And if you'd like to know more about my own experience of shifting, my book, The Shift, How I Lost and Found Myself After 40, and You Can Too, is out now in paperback. See you next time.